Any questions from the first part of toxicology? I always ask that, but it's always important to see if anyone has at least reviewed things. Maybe they have a question or two about something. Who knows? Maybe they had a recent overdose in their life of caffeine or alcohol. Who knows? You, you never know. Um, all right, so we're going to continue on with envenomations. These are mainly focused on things you might find in Florida, but certainly find outside of that. So um, they'll be the, the main focus here. So the first thing, oh, trigger warning. Big pictures of snakes coming up. So if you are phobic, <laughs> just cover your eyes. Okay, so uh, what are the common snakes you're going to run into in Florida? Uh, there's kind of two main varieties of snakes we'll run into. There's the Crotalidae, which are the pit vipers, right? Those are the ones with big scary fangs. Uh, and then you have the Elapidae, which are going to be our coral snakes. Okay, so those are the kind of two main varieties. It's important to make sure uh, you keep those distinctions separate because they are going to have much, uh, very different toxicity, and the treatment's going to be obviously uh, going to be very different as well. Um, so the big things you run into from the pit viper perspective are going to be the copperheads, uh, the cottonmouths or the water moccasins, uh, eastern diamondbacks, uh, pygmy rattlesnakes. Those are the most common pit vipers you run into, uh, and then you'll have the eastern coral snake, which is our, our main elapidae, right? So. Uh, when you look at the coral snakes, you're going to put them in kind of a more category akin to like cobras and, and things like that based on their, their toxins. Anyway, um, when do we have the most uh, common bites or when is it most likely to have bites? Usually the kind of May to October time frame. And what do you guys think that is? Because they're outside. Also, what, what's the temperature like? Hot as Hades, right? So it gets very, very hot. And this is when the snakes are more likely to be active. They're out there. Um, and so this is when you see a lot of bites. Now, Thing being in Florida is the fact that we are very warm throughout the entire year, so it's not uncommon that we'll be managing uh, snake bite cases like through November um, at the poison center. So it'll still happen, especially uh, when you consider who the very frequent victims are going to be of this. So um, you will certainly have some people who are collectors of snakes. Um, has anyone been to the St. Cloud Serpentarium? Okay, you can go check that out there. It's got a giant cobra out front, a big cardboard cobra. Um, there's a good one to land if you ever go check that out. But there are certainly collectors who are at risk for bites, obviously because they're handling them uh, more more commonly. Um, children tend to be, uh, you know, curious. Uh, they're out there, especially during spring break or during summer breaks. They're out there in the yards and can uh, get into trouble there. Um, and then men typically are more likely to be bitten as well. Anyone think why that is? Huh? The women okay, the women may send the men out to, to kill the snakes. That is one thing. Any other reasons? So we, we'll talk about the, the seven T's of snake bites. And those are the things that make you more at risk uh, for developing a snake bite. It's usually uh, testosterone is a big one. Uh, tequila or alcohol is a big one. Um, usually toothless, uh, tattoos, uh, trucks. Uh, so like you're kind of getting a picture of the type of people we deal with. On a routine basis. Okay. Unfortunately, it's true. I, I come from these people. I know it. Uh, it is it's just the case. So, my favorite snake bite case was uh, I'll talk about more when we get to the coral snakes, but it was a guy who uh, ended up getting bit on the face, uh, actually on the lip, because he wanted to take a picture with it. He's, this, is, this is like a proto selfie. Uh, you know, back and back before that was more uh, more common. But yeah, so again, um, you have to think about where bites typically occur as well. Um, so again, people who are, you know, if they're gardening and they're reaching in, usually the hands are going to be a common source for bites. Sometimes the face, if they're being especially stupid. Um, and also the feet can be uh, another big one, right? So the legs uh, tend to be bitten uh, if you have an accidental, like you're stepping on them or, or something like that. Uh, here's a picture of the pygmy rattlesnake. Um, these are not the most poisonous ones that we have here in Florida, but they are, they're pretty mean, and so they tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, so these are one of the most common ones we get bites for uh, when dealing with the cases being called into the poison center. So you can notice uh, this nice little rattle here at the very end. Laser pointer out. Nice little rattle. Uh, how else do you think you can identify a, a poisonous snake here in Florida? Yeah, so the triangle shaped head, so you notice like the, the head here is going to be wider uh, at the base than, than the neck is, so that's a good one. Huh? The colors is tough, and we'll talk about that in, in just a minute, but sometimes the colors can be misleading. You can see, you know, if you see a big black snake, is that going to be a uh, water moccasin or is that going to be, you know, a non-poisonous variety? So sometimes the colors misleading, so we don't always rely, our, uh, rely on that. Um, what other things might you see? You running away? Yep, there could be one. <laughs> Like enormous fangs, like that could be a pretty good sign. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's a good one. Well, you'd be surprised. We get a lot of bites. Okay, um, and so again, uh, are you always going to see a rattle on those snakes? No. 
not always, right? So if you hear it, that's great. It's a good defensive mechanism for the snakes and you can get away. Um, but sometimes if they've recently shed or something, you will actually find they don't have a rattle for some time. So you can't use that as your positive identification. We'll talk about a few other things we can use to identify these. As um, here's an example of, I, at first I thought this was like a double-headed uh, copperhead. I realized this is just two snakes uh, laying on top of each other. <laughs> snake buds uh, but that's a copperhead um, if you're looking on the scale of toxicity these are probably the most minor out of the bunch um, there are some cases where um, a lot of people won't even actually treat these with the, the anti-venom because they're they're fairly minor we'll talk about what the symptoms are uh, that'll show up after a bite but these guys are, are, are pretty weak on, for the most part um, you know they just there's venom just doesn't really pack them uh, of a bite uh, pun intended uh, next you have the water moccasins or the cotton mouths so you guys know where they get the cotton mouth name from Big white mouth, right? So open up the big white mouth, so that's where they got that name from. But again, these can be confused with a lot of other types of like water snakes or black snakes and things like that. So the color pattern can be a little bit deceiving from, from that standpoint. Uh, and then we have the Eastern Diamondback. These guys are really, really nasty. They're very big bodied snakes. They are, uh, they inject a ton of venom. They require a lot of anti-venom in order to, to counteract that. So on the scale of things, you probably have like your Eastern Diamondbacks being the most uh, venomous. Uh, the, Copperheads, I'm sorry, the uh, the cottonmouths, uh, water moccasins, then you have your pygmy rattlesnakes, and then you have your, your uh, copperheads, right? Uh, so it's kind of the general order of things. And so if I hear eastern diamondback bite, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a pretty major one. We're going to expect to need a lot of anti-venom in order to reverse this. But uh, again, don't always rely on the rattle being there because it may, not, may or may not be there. So some other ways we can identify them. Obviously, we call them pit vipers because they have these nice heat sensing pits on their on their faces. Hopefully, you're not close enough again to, to go to uh, pick those out. But other things you're going to be looking for, obviously, going to be the the uh, hinge uh, fangs there. You're looking for the pupils. Typically, these are going to be elliptical, right, instead of being just circular. Um, so again, if you're thinking if it's a pit viper or not, and they have a circular pupil, chances are it's not. Do people bring these in? Like, do they bring the snake in with them? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is that, oh, I got bit by this. I decapitated it. Here you go. Yeah. Nowadays, we have cell phone cameras. So I say, just take a picture and bring it on in. I don't need to actually see the snake, because then we have to get rid of it, and it's kind of gross. Um, also, what's the problem with the de uh, decapitated uh, snake head? They can still bite. They still have those reflex mechanisms to chomp down on things. So fortunately, we've never had any ER cases where they've been bitten there. But um, one time I had a, a resident who sent me a picture in the morning uh, during my fellowship, and it just like the head was like on her on her hand. And I was just like, oh gosh, hopefully I didn't still have any you know residual nerve activity. But fortunately, I did not. So she she was fine. Um, so going with that, so I, I noticed anal plates here. Like, who ever thought they would need to consider anal plates on the snake, right? Um, <laughs> so this is one of those things we actually can look for as well. So uh, if you're looking uh, at a snake, if you, the subcaudal plates, since you're, uh, the other name for them, uh, if you're looking at a single row, that would end up being a poisonous snake versus a double row ends up being a non-poisonous snake. So sometimes if you have a decapitated snake where they don't have the head and they just bring the body in, you can actually look at that and get an idea whether it was poisonous or not. That can be useful, right? Because uh, again, uh, monitoring these patients, evaluating them for a potential dry bite or non-venomous bite is, is going to be an important part of this. Um, also, when you're evaluating your patient, you're looking for the number of strikes that occurred. Hopefully it's just one, but it could be, could be more or less. Um, how many fang marks would you expect to see? Two, like, can you see more or less? Depends, yeah. So sometimes you may have like three, because sometimes you'll have like a new thing that's coming in. Uh, sometimes the fang will have broken off, and so you only have like one puncture mark. Um, so just be aware, you may not just always see the two. It could be more or less, depending on what's going on. Um, the venom status of the snake is also going to be uh, variable, depending on uh, when the last time they ate was, uh, what time of year it is, and, and things like that. Because again, when they're biting a person, are they looking at that them like their next meal? Probably not. It's really just a defensive kind of strike. Um, so in a lot of cases, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to give you their full load uh, if they, they're able to control that. Um, if they've just eaten recently, they're not going to have as much venom stored up uh, versus if they haven't eaten for a while, then they might have a lot more built up. So again, it's going to depend. Um, obviously, the size of the snake, the bigger the snake, the more venom it could potentially inject versus, you know, if you have a little tiny infant one. Um, and then you're also looking at the location of the bite. We mentioned here in the States, we have a lot more hand bites um, you would expect to see just because people grab them and pick them up and, and things like that versus uh, if you're dealing with like snakes from outside of the country and a lot more where they're more kind of occupationally based, you're going to see that they uh, tend to be the feet getting bitten more frequently. But here, because we have people who are not necessarily Darwin's uh, leaders, uh, we, you know, a lot of hand bites. Okay. 
you can see here the uh, examples of the, the subcaudal plates here. Uh, again, a uh, non-venomous snake would end up having this double row versus the single row. Um, and then you can obviously see the, the things here like the elliptical pupils, the, the hinge fangs, and all of that. Um, again, this only will kind of uh, work for... North American pit vipers. You're going to find as soon as you get out of the country or go to another hemisphere, like things uh, definitely change up a bit, um, especially when you're looking at like, you know, your lapidae and your cobras and things like that. So we'll talk more about that in the coral snakes. So um, here's some examples of what some of these bites can look like. Um, we'll talk about the, the toxin in just a second, but essentially um, you're seeing a lot of necrosis of tissue. You're going to see a lot of ecchymosis. Um, you're going to see a lot of swelling associated with this, right? So these uh, very common to see bites that look just like this. Um, limbs get very, very swollen, a lot of ecchymosis uh, and tissue necrosis happening. Uh, basically, there's lots of different components to the venom. Uh, there's proteolytic enzymes, there's procoagulants, there's anticoagulants, there's cardiotoxins in some cases. Um, so you have to be kind of uh, wary of lots of different presentations for these. But typically, you're going to run up and see direct tissue damage, uh, usually swelling around the site uh, where it occurred, but it could be spreading uh, distally uh, away from the site. Um, and you're also going to be seeing a lot of effects on the cellular components of the blood. So looking at your CBCs, looking at your coags is really, really important here because um, you're going to expect these to be deranged with more kind of systemic envenomations, okay? Um, you'll find that some snakes may actually uh, be associated with some neurotoxins. So there's like a Mojave rattlesnake you can find more out west. They actually have a neurotoxic component to it. So they can actually see more of like paresthesias and, and, uh, and numbness and things like that. Um, and then it's important to distinguish between the local and the systemic effects. We're going to be monitoring for both. And that's very frequently what we're going to be using to decide whether we use our antivenom or not. <clears throat> so local effects are mainly just going to be uh, limb swelling, uh, the, you know, the, um, you know, the bruising that's happening there, the, all the ecchymosis, all of that stuff. That's what you're looking for. But then the systemic effects as well. Um, looking for changes in your coag, so you'd, you'd expect PTINR to go up, PTT is going to go up, um, platelets typically go down, and fibrinogen is another thing we're going to be monitoring for, and that will typically go down as well. Okay. And the big thing here is you're monitoring for abnormal trends. You're looking for things that are going in the wrong direction. You know, if your platelets drop by, you know, 100 points, like that's that's a significant trend, right? That's it could be a thing we end up treating for. Um, you know, lots of painful swelling, paresthesias potentially. Um, again, you can find uh, you know bites where you know the the limb will basically two or three times size of the the unaffected limb. They get very very swollen. Uh, a lot of people are thinking you know compartment syndrome, right? They're really kind of concerned about that, and so that's where that's kind of led to some uh, um, unfortunate fasciotomies, which we'll talk about. We don't really recommend uh, for a lot of these bites. Um, some patients may develop some degree of rhabdo, so you uh, can consider checking a CK. Uh, potentially, uh, there's a cane break rattlesnake that you don't run into too frequently, but every once in a while that can potentially lead to a uh, case of rhabdomyolysis. But um, just looking at the, the envenomations, as I mentioned before, rattlesnakes tend to be kind of the worst ones, followed by the, uh, the moccasins and then finally the copperheads. So, um, also systemic reactions. You can expect to see a lot of uh, anxiety associated with this, a lot of pain associated with this. So, um, you know, patients typically get pretty freaked out when they get bitten by one of these snakes, and especially when their arm is swelling up, you know, to twice its normal size, things like that. So sometimes you have to kind of manage them from that standpoint as well, using some anxiolytics and, and whatnot to try to calm them down. Um, very rarely do you ever see renal failure, but it's more secondary to that rhabdo that I mentioned uh, that can occur occasionally. Um, but the main thing here is going to be this uh, hematologic toxicity, okay? So that's going to be the main thing you can't really see, but you can at least monitor for it with labs. Okay, so how do we manage these patients? Uh, so they present to you in the ER and they say, hey, I got bit by a snake. What do you want to do? Um, the first thing, if they're asymptomatic, if they're having no swelling, uh, and they're having no changes in their coags. Typically what you do is you get a baseline set of coags as soon as they present, you'll get another set about six to eight hours later, and you're looking for any abnormal trends. So if the PT starts going up, if their platelets drop, if their fibrinogen drops significantly, that would be a sign that, hey, they're probably getting some kind of systemic uh, effect from the venom here. Um, let's go ahead and, and potentially treat. Uh, if they remain asymptomatic for the eight to 12 hours, no swelling, no changes in coags, you can actually send them on their way, right? Um, other things you really want to be looking for are make sure you're doing good wound care. So make sure you clean the site off so you don't have any secondary infections. Uh, make sure the patient's up to date on their tetanus status, okay? A lot of these guys uh, probably not gotten a tetanus in 20 plus years, so go ahead and give them a tetanus update uh, if they need it. Yeah. Um, other things you could potentially do is you can actually do uh, x-rays to look for, like, uh, if a fang broke off in the, in the wound, things like that, you can actually do an x-ray to look for foreign bodies. Um, pretty rare that you'd actually ever find that, though, so it's kind of plus or minus on, on that one. Um, 
And and again, when we're looking at this asymptomatic, uh, this kind of observation period, we're looking for dry bites, right? Dry bites meaning that uh, the snake bit, but there's no venom injected. And that's probably about a quarter of bites you're going to run into, right? Because again, you're not, they're not looking at you like your food. Um, so about 25% of the time, you can expect there to be no venom injected. The patient will remain asymptomatic. It'll be painful, but you shouldn't expect to see a lot of that uh, more systemic effects or more of that kind of local swelling. So um, things not to do. Don't put a tourniquet on it, right? Why do you think that's the problem? So it could, you know, the idea is to keep the venom all kind of local, right? Why is that a problem though? Hmm? Okay, so maybe you like see some concentration of it, and then you know what happens? When you take that tourniquet off. All goes rushing into the system, right? So there's been cases where um, patients have uh, removed a tourniquet, all of a sudden get a big influx of all that venom into the, the system, and they've seen cardiovascular shock secondary to that. So we recommend it not from that standpoint. And then again, if you get bitten by a snake and you're really freaked out, um, how tight are you going to put that tourniquet on if you're not a medical person? Super tight, like to the point where you're probably causing more tissue damage just from hypoxia than anything else. So do not recommend putting tourniquets on. Um, in some cases, like in, in places like Australia, where like, you know, you may be hours and hours away from like medical care, they have a lot of very uh, toxic, neurotoxic snakes there. There's a, a type of wrap they'll recommend. Uh, it's called Sutherland wrap, where basically it's like an ace bandage, um, very lightly wrapped around, you know, the, the limb, and you can still put your fingers behind it. And the idea there is it actually stops lymph drainage uh, of some of the venoms. But here, you know, hospital care is, uh, is generally pretty close in a lot of cases we don't really need to worry about tourniquets okay next thing uh don't suck or try to cut out the venom unless you have like a really you know good friend you want to like have suck your arm for just for fun um it's not going to be very effective though right and if you think about it, like you know if the with those hinge fangs they don't just kind of bite down into the limb they're kind of going to bite in and kind of back so even if you're trying to suck it out there's there's kits out there for for suction um they're not really going to get that venom out and it doesn't really do any good and anything it causes probably more damage to to the, the tissue right there so with dog bites No, because again, you're it's um, again you're probably causing more tissue damage just by kind of you know applying pressure there, and again it's already causing you know kind of some anticoagulant effects anyway. That yeah, so we just recommend just uh, uh, not doing that. So. Um, uh, so, and I, I oftentimes tell people, especially if they're calling the poison centers, like, hey, the best thing you can do as far as first aid goes for a snake bite is a set of car keys. I told that to a class one time, and they said, do they rub the car keys on the... <laughs> nope, they should drive to the ER. That's what they should do. Um, okay, so again, assess their tetanus status. Look for allergies. There's going to be some specific allergies we'll talk about when we get to the antivenom. You want to make sure they do not have beforehand, because they could cross-react. Uh, and then also looking for previous antivenom administration. Um, by getting repeated doses of the antivenom, you do run the risk of having uh, allergies. This is going to be more of a problem when uh, some of the, the full antibody type antivenoms, and we'll talk about the differences between those in just a little bit, but uh, anytime you're getting a full antibody, uh, you're running that risk of developing a reaction to it. And so you've had some cases of handlers who had exotic snakes, and we had to give them uh, a South African uh, uh, cobra antivenom, essentially, they had to give it to them multiple times, and sure enough, anaphylaxis the second time you end up receiving it, because it was a full equine or horse antibody, um, and just, you know, we end up having to treat through that. So again, ask about previous administrations, could put them at risk for uh, an allergic reaction. And obviously, treat the pain and anxiety, you know, use some benzos if you need to. Oftentimes, opiates are needed uh, in order to help deal with the pain because it can be very severe in these, in these uh, bites. So uh, as far as the measuring goes, we want to make sure we're doing circumferential measurement, right? So we're going to be measuring around the limb to look for increases in, in the girth of the limb. Um, it's important that when we're doing this, you make your line, because uh, you're going to be using, like, a, um, uh, I think of the measuring tape. Using measuring tape, you want to make sure you're marking on either side of that with a pen, right? And why do you think I want to do that? Yes, yeah, so you do it the exact same spot. Because the problem is if you have like change of shift um, and you only had one mark, some nurse might try to measure it on one side of the line and then they measure it on the other side of the line potentially. And then now you have different measurements and it looks like the size is going up or is going down potentially. Um, so we want to make sure we get the same measurements every time. So we make them do two lines there. Okay. Um, you're going to be doing that every 15 minutes initially to see how, how things are progressing. Um, you're going to be also marking the leading edge of things to see how far it's been uh, progressing from the, the initial bite site. Um, we're also going to be measuring your coags initially, so you'll look at PT, PTINR, platelets, uh, fibrinogen, uh, PTT there, uh, and you'll do an initial one and then at, uh, six hours later to look for any abnormal trends there. Okay. Um, 
And again, a lot of these envenomations can look like compartment syndrome. The limbs are going to look very, very swollen. They're going to look very, very tight. Um, we do not recommend surgical intervention for these um, because of the fact that you can give antivenom in order to help uh, halt that progression of swelling. And it's not going to reverse it automatically, but it can help to halt it. Uh, and then typically, uh, you know, just by giving antivenom, uh, the, the arm is going to have or the limb is not going to have any kind of long lasting residual effects. Uh, the pressure will go down on its own. OK. Um, so occasionally we may have to do a digitotomy it feels like a bite to the the finger and it gets very very swollen just because i can't really deal with pressure as well as like you know a forearm could um so in rare cases we have to do a digitotomy but uh, again not, not very common we also very rarely have to get blood products these patients don't typically end up bleeding um like you would expect based on their coax it's more of a kind of like a dic kind of looking picture um so uh, rarely do we have to get blood products uh, but if you notice an, an actual uh, obvious bleed their hemoglobin is dropping pretty precipitously you may need to replace it at that point <clears throat> Because again, if I give blood products, the venom is just going to affect that blood products as well, right? So it's only going to be kind of a temporary fix. Uh, just some example of what you know the, some of the fasciotomies would look like. Obviously, we do our patients like that. So again, giving more antivenom is going to help fix things. Okay, uh, so the antivenom we're going to use is called Crofab. Has anyone heard of Crofab before? So this is going to be our antivenom. It's specifically going to be used for North American pit vipers. Okay, so it's actually uh, derived from ovine sources. Do you guys know what ovine sources are? sheep absolutely so uh, they're derived from sheep basically we took a bunch of sheep we uh, hyper immunized them to a couple of different uh, snakes here so you see we, we injected them with uh, western diamondback eastern diamondback mojave and cottonmouth uh, venom basically uh, gathered up those antibodies spun them down isolate them then we actually used a process where you can uh, you end up getting a, a fab fragment from that so basically when you inject a full antibody uh, you're much more likely to react to that because it's just a large protein, right? Uh, but if I can start to shorten that up by cutting off part of the FC portion, and we call this a fab fragment, um, you can end up having uh, less likely to react to it, um, or you know, less uh, likelihood of having anaphylaxis, and it's going to be much better tolerated by the patient. Okay, so we'll look at a comparison between the, the pit viper antivenom versus the coral snake because they're very different. But this one is a fab fragment. They cut off part of the FC portion. They actually use uh, papain. Uh, which is found in the fruit papaya, uh, to actually cleave that, okay? So anyway, so uh, our indications for when we'd want to administer this is that they're having a uh, progression of swelling, right? So usually I would say that, you know, if you get bit on, say, the hand and it progresses past a major joint, so if it goes past the wrist, that's pretty progressive swelling. If you're starting to do those circumferential measurements, you're noticing that's starting to go up pretty significantly, that would be another indication to go ahead and treat based on uh, just on the, the uh, swelling happening there. Um, if you see any noticeable coagulopathy or you're having an abnormal trend in the platelets going down, fibrinogen going down, things like that, that would also be another indication to do so. Uh, and then any hemodynamic or neuromuscular compromise there. Okay, so those are main indications. Uh, and and you guys have, know how expensive these protein-based antibodies are? Very expensive. It's about $5,200 for two vials of this stuff. And so we'll look at the dosing in just a second. So uh, our initial, oh yes. Does every hospital have this around? Every hospital carries Crofab, at least here in, in Florida, right? Because it happens often enough. Um, very frequently, they uh, go on a consignment program where basically the hospitals can carry it. They don't pay for it until they use it. Okay. Yeah, so that's a, a good cost-saving measure that a lot of hospitals will, will do. So almost everyone has Crofab, okay? Um, just because bites in Florida are so ubiquitous. So everyone should at least have enough for an initial dose, and then they can order more to, to kind of cover them. But that initial dose, anywhere between four to six vials. So you can see if it's $5,200 for two vials, you're already up to like $15,000 potentially for a more severe bite, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why it's really important to call the poison centers because we deal with them all the time. You know, we can kind of give you an idea of like, okay, well, how bad is the swelling? Maybe you should hold it off. Maybe you should go ahead and give it now. Um, give you a better idea of how to, kind of how to manage that. So we can be, you know, kind of cost saving from that, that standpoint. Because again, you never want to give uh, the Crofab and then end up it being a dry bite and you kind of look silly for, for wasting all that money, right? Don't want to do that. So um, essentially what we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll base how many vials we give based off the, the symptomatology. So, you know, if it's been an hour and their limb is already twice the size uh, when it started, um, that's pretty progressive swelling. I'm going to go ahead and just probably start with six vials versus if it's been six hours and now they're starting to have a coagulopathy, maybe I'll start with four vials, okay? So really kind of just using your, your clinical guest job on, on, on how to, to manage that. Uh, and then you give, uh, basically put in 250 Van S, run over an hour, and you're looking for signs of anaphylaxis. You know, you can start off at a few mLs per hour and kind of gently titrate the dose up uh, and see how they tolerate it. Um, and then we'll actually draw another set of coags one hour after the infusion to look for any kind of abnormal trends there. Hopefully we're starting to see recovery of the coags if they are uh, if they were abnormal to begin with. So you start to see your platelets come up, you'll start to see fibrinogen come up, and other things start to normalize out. Um, now, would you, what would you imagine the PEDS dosing to be? 
actually the same because again the snake's not looking at you and be like okay you're only about six i'm going to inject this much venom versus <laughs> right because you're, you're basically just trying to give enough anti-venom to, to neutralize whatever the snake injected so it doesn't matter what, what size the patient is the dose will be the same and then we actually, because we're only doing the fab fragments, a shorter antibody gets cleared faster from the bloodstream. And so we actually end up having to give repeated doses. So you end up having to give this maintenance dosing where you do two vials every six hours for three doses. So basically the patient's getting about 24 hours of coverage of this antivenom. Uh, and again, we're measuring coags if there's any kind of abnormalities there to make sure that things are staying, um, uh, things are working out. And then typically once they're post maintenance, we'll end up watching them say 12, 24 hours afterwards, make sure they don't have any recurrent coagulopathy. That can be a thing where um, you know, you'll treat a patient, they, they look good, you know, swelling is under control, uh, and then you know, 18 hours out later, they'll have their coax start to go out of whack. Right? So that's one of those things we monitor for uh, after they're done with getting the crofab. Because again, sometimes you'll just have pockets of venom that will end up being absorbed kind of slowly uh, later on and during the course than and, and, uh, what was kind of absorbed earlier. So um, just keep in mind that Crofab does not reverse any of the actual swelling that's occurred. So you're not going like, to give it to them and their arm's going to magically shrink. Uh, it will stop further progression of swelling, though. That's what we're looking for. Um, sometimes we'll give patients, you know, the initial six vials, and that does not control the swelling. It's still progressing. We'll actually give them another bolus, potentially, right? So it's all kind of based off how the patient's uh, handling it. Um, and if they do have an anaphylactic reaction, sometimes you end up having to treat through that, right? So we'll kind of load them up with some steroids, give them some uh, Venadryl, and have Epi at the bedside ready to go in case they have a true true problem there. Um, we've had cases of like cobra bites where the patient ended up having a, a severe anaphylactic reaction, and we just had to treat them right through it. Uh, ended up having to put them on Epi drip to deal with the hypotension, but again, uh, you know, that we didn't want to be on the ventilator for you know two weeks due to the neurotoxic effects. So. Um, as far as education goes for when these patients get discharged, patient, uh, important to we have them follow up about 24 to 48 hours later for a repeat set of coax if they had an initial coagulopathy to look for any kind of um, you know, late presenting uh, coag issues there. And then um, if you come back in and you're acquiring crofab again for another bite, because again, uh, something that tends to predispose these people to more bites is the, the initial bite, right? because they probably have not changed their behaviors uh, to prevent themselves from being bitten in the first place. So um, they, make sure you let people know that they are, you know, have them tell you if they took Crofab before to make sure that they're not gonna be at risk for that anaphylaxis. Um, some patients will get a serum sickness, which is essentially if you end up having um, you know, these antibodies injected into it, you can have a kind of a delayed uh, uh, autoimmune reaction to that. Uh, and so you can end up seeing, uh, you know, kind of some fever-like symptoms, you know, myalgias, fever, things like that. Um, usually you can just treat it with over-the-counter medications and it's, you know, maybe 24, 48 hours worth and they're, they're usually fine from that standpoint. But just let, let them know they're gonna feel like they have the flu potentially. Um, and also have them, you know, for the next couple of days, don't go any for any elective dental procedures, no contact sports, because they could be more at risk for, for bleeds. Okay. Um, the allergy thing I was mentioning with the Crofab is that because we're using papain to uh, shorten down that uh, the antibody, if they have a, a papaya allergy, that would be one thing you'd want to watch out for. And they also have, they have a latex allergy. There's some latex used in order to produce that antibody. So watch out for those. But we're still going to get it. You can still potentially give it, yeah. You just want to know about it so you can at least be aware and potentially pre-dose pre them with some steroids and, and antihistamines. Yep. Okay, so next uh, we'll move on, and that was the pit vipers, right? So that's only for the North American pit vipers. Um, you will find that there will be some cross reactivity. We've actually had some exotic snakes where we've had like a Mexican cantile, which is basically like a, a Mexican water moccasin, uh, and there was enough homology amongst the venom that we actually were able to give crofab, and then the patient had good results with that, right? So you can find sometimes it'll have cross reactivity there. Uh, in other cases, though, you know you're going to find that crofab does not work for a coral snake bite because the venom is just too different. It's not the antibodies are not going to be able to neutralize that. Okay. So. Uh, next up, we'll have the Elapidae, or the Eastern Coral Snake. It's the main one you're going to find in Florida. And as far as coral snakes go, um, there's a few other varieties. You have like a Sonoran Coral Snake or a Texas Coral Snake. Those really aren't that venomous. Uh, really, it's here in Florida. We have the the, uh, the Coral Snake capital of the U.S., uh, where we have the Eastern Coral Snakes. And they're pretty pr uh, prevalent, especially here in kind of Central Florida. Uh, we tend to see them. The most bites end up going into the Tampa Center uh, more than anything. So lucky you guys, right? Anyway, so how do you identify these guys? Uh, basically, you're looking for a black snout. Notice these are going to have those kind of uh, those things I mentioned about non-poisonous snakes previously. They're going to have the round pupils. They're not going to have the big fangs. Um, so you need to identify them based on color. Okay. And so basically, you want to look at around the middle of the body because if you look on either end, you'll notice the coloring pattern kind of goes out the window. Uh, but we use that uh, saying: red on black, venom black, friend of Jack, whatever it happens to be. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. Right. So red on yellows, and you can notice that here. 
So again, you have that red on yellow coloring pattern here. That lets you know that yes, this is a coral snake versus if you had, uh, say, a uh, scarlet king snake, which is another common one this gets mixed up with, you know, red on black, that would not be a problem, right? Um, also, they typically have very small things. They're kind of rear hinged, so you don't really see those two big hypodermic needles sticking out of their mouth like you would expect to see like a pit viper, right? Um, I follow the saying, red on black, run the heck away. Red on yellow, run the heck away. Just don't bother snakes and you're fine. But if you're a child, you'll notice that like, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where they're colorful. Hey, I want to grab this. Look at this. Woo -hoo. Or if you're an adult male, you're intoxicated. Uh, that would also be another thing. Hey, look, it's colorful. Let me play with this. And sometimes the, the, the IQ values are not really in the high ranges for, for some of these patients. So um, the venom here you're going to find is much different than the pit vipers. It's uh, primarily going to be neurotoxic. Uh, basically, it's going to have these curare-like effects where they actually prevent release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, right? So by blocking uh, the, the release of acetylcholine, uh, you're going to end up seeing you have these um, you know, very minor local effects. You may see a little bit of swelling at the bite site. You may see a little bit of uh, uh, some redness, but they're really not going to have any of the ecchymosis, none of that tissue damage you see there. Uh, the thing we do worry about is going to be the neurotoxic effects. You expect to see paresthesias. I expect to see numbness, and, and that will eventually travel more centrally. And the big thing you're worried about is going to be this diaphragmatic paralysis, right? So what we found is when these patients end up uh, getting uh, respiratory failure, they end up having to go on the vent for quite a long time. I, you know, my research was on coral snakes, uh, and basically it ended up being like you know nine days was the average that they end up having to be on the ventilator. So it's not an un, un, um, something we can prevent, uh, but it's certainly a very serious complication you'd like to, to avoid. So these guys are typically, um, they're very defensive. They're very kind of evasive kind of snakes. They don't want to bite you, right? Because they're, again, they're not looking at you like their next meal. Um, so very uh, commonly, this is going to be, bites are going to be more off to the hands because it's usually people picking them up and, and playing them with them or whatever happens to be. Uh, my favorite bite ever uh, was this uh, gentleman. He's probably in his 60s from middle of nowhere, woods, Georgia, actually got life flighted to us uh, in Jacksonville for a coral snake bite. Um, and I was talking to him and I said, you know, hey, um, so what was happening is like, I was walking through the woods and I found the snake and I picked him up and the little sucker bit me. And I was like, okay, well, you know, usually with the coral snakes, because they don't have those big fangs, they have to sit there and chew on you actually. They have to sit there and macerate before the, they can actually break skin and inject the venom. So typically if the history is the snake fell right off, then it probably was a dry bite, right? You still monitor them, but it was probably going to be a dry bite. No, nothing injected there. Um, the thing you worry about is if it grabbed on and it sat there and chewed for a while and you had to pull it off, right? They talk about it sounding like Velcro when you pull it off. That's usually a sign that some venom has been uh, injected there, okay? So anyway, so I was talking to the guy. He said, yeah, I picked up and the sucker bit me and it fell right off. Like, okay, well, that doesn't sound like uh, it was an actual bite. You know, we ended up giving him anti-venom uh, for, for his symptoms. I like, well, so what happened after that? Well, I picked him up again, and then the little, little guy bit me, and then it fell right off. And I was like, okay, that still doesn't sound like an actual bite happened here. And I was like, so what happened after that? Well, the third time I picked him up, the sucker just bit, bit me and just had to pull him off. And I was like, okay, so the snake gave you three tries, and you, you <laughs> failed this one. Okay. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so anyway, so this guy got life flighted to us. He was having all these uh, symptoms. You get more kind of central effects as, as the venom starts to progress, uh, usually through the lymphatic drainage. Uh, you see slurred speech. You can see paresthesias. Uh, and, and eventually, you're going to have, uh, you know, fasciculations, weakness, and this respiratory paralysis. That's really the big thing we're worried about. So which is why if we have a history that the snake held on and chewed for a while, that uh, leads us to more think, hey, we probably need to treat this uh, in order to prevent these complications uh, rather than, than waiting around. So um, the effects can be very prolonged, say days to weeks. Uh, and, but the paralysis is reversible, so it does go away with time. It just may take a while in order for the uh, for the uh, neurotoxic effects to, to recede. So. Uh, for initial management for these patients, because of the fact that you can actually have delayed presentations uh, uh, for these patients, you know, they could take a while, even 18 hours before some of these uh, neurotoxic symptoms show up, um, we actually uh, will monitor them for 24 hours uh, from the time they get to the ED uh, in the ICU. Because again, they need very frequent neuro checks, so you're not going to be able to get those kind of checks on, on the floor typically. So again, ICU admission, monitor them for 24 hours. If they remain asymptomatic, then you send them on home. You're still doing your wound care, you're still giving their tetanus updates if they need it, all that good stuff. Um, now again, no cutting, sucking, biting, tourniquets, nothing like that. We just don't want to delay medical attention, just get them into the ER uh, for evaluation. So no good first aid measures there. Uh, and then once they're in the ED, again, you're going to be checking for allergies. Make sure they've not received any antivenom before, because uh, again, they'd be more at risk for having anaphylaxis, all that good stuff. Um, and uh, again, no prophylactic antibiotics, that's not recommended for these. Um, and again, we're going to be doing very frequent neuro checks, probably every 15 minutes or so uh, up front. 
So we do have an antivenom for this. this is the uh, the uh, Lapidae antivenom. Uh, it's an equine derived antibody. So it's actually the full antibody we're getting from a horse. Uh, it's actually a very uh, it's a fairly old drug. Uh, and and the problem is that we had for a while is that it was actually not in production. And again, if you imagine, um, we probably only get about 50 coral snake bites a year here in Florida. So if you consider all these kind of orphan indications, this would certainly be one. And it's very expensive to make this kind of drug, right? Um, so the problem is like, you know, the, the drug manufacturers don't have a lot of uh, impetus to say, hey, let's keep making this uh, from a money standpoint, because it's not a really big money making venture. It's expensive to make uh, equine antibodies and whatnot. So, um, they're working on producing it again. Uh, the new stock has not hit the market. And actually, for a while, all we had was expired drug. And so the FDA would actually go back in and check the drug to make sure it was still effective. And so we would extend the expiration to every single year. So uh, it's one of those things where we had to be very uh, cautious with our stock because once it was gone, it was going to be gone, right? So there's nothing we could really do at that point. Um, so basically, we would be very uh, careful. We'd actually wait until they develop symptoms before we actually started treating. And we would usually uh, use three to five vials initially based on how symptomatic they were. Again, um, not based on peds dosing or anything like that. It's just based on how symptomatic they were uh, in relation to when the bite happened. Um, because this is a full equine antibody, we actually do skin tests beforehand to see if the patient's going to have a reaction. Um, so we'll basically do a one to 10 dilution of the, the antivenom. We'll do a, a little sub-Q blep, uh, and we see if there's a wheel and flare reaction. Uh, if they don't have a reaction, they still may have uh, a problem when you inject it intravenously, but chances are it's going to be less. Uh, and again, you always want to have your anaphylaxis kit at the bedside ready to go. Okay, so keep Epi ready. Um, and if they do have a wheel and flare reaction, you need to treat it through. Uh, go ahead and pre pre dose them with steroids and and, uh, and Benadryl. So again. Um, and this one is much more likely to have serum sickness just because it's a, a larger uh, protein uh, and your body's more likely to kind of uh, take notice of it and, and cause those kind of delayed uh, kind of flu-like reactions. Okay, so very, very briefly, um, so what would you do if you had an exotic bite? So if a guy showed up and said, my cobra bit me, what would you do? Call the poison center. Call the poison center? That's a good, that's a good first step. What do you think we would do at that point? Google. Google? <laughs> no, we actually have, re you guys might Google first, but uh, we actually have resources. Uh, so we actually had, uh, we have calls like this sometimes that come in. So I remember being in the ER one day, um, this is not no more, this is, uh, where I was doing my fellowship and, and EMS was calling in. It's like, do you guys got Cobra venom, anti-venom? And we're like, okay, hold on. Like they were calling around every single hospital they could to like bring this guy in uh, looking for Cobra anti-venom. We're just like, okay, nowhere has Cobra anti-venom. Just bring him to us and we'll be able to, to figure it out. So there's a couple of resources that we'll actually use. Um, do you know who has to carry uh, uh, anti-venom for their snakes that they hold? Zoos. Zoos, absolutely. So zoos have to have uh, anti-venom for all their snakes, right? So, and for instance, up in Jacksonville, we have a very good relationship with our herpetologists, and we can actually, uh, we've gotten antivenom from them previously for some of our handlers that have things like uh, um, uh, you know, cobra bites and, and things like that. Um, so that's one way we do it. We also, also have a nice database where we, uh, the poison centers are linked up with the, uh, the AZA or the American Zoological Association, and we can actually look to see um, who, what, um, what different zoos have antivenoms. So we can actually go through and say, okay, uh, you know, these guys had the South African uh, Elapidae antivenom. Um, let's go ahead and get some from them. You know, sometimes it's uh, ground transport, sometimes it's flown, uh, it just depends. Ideally, your exotic handlers would have their own antivenom, but that's not usually the case. Uh, they're usually not very responsible from that standpoint uh, and will not, um, not have their own antivenom, which is, is, is problematic. Um, and again, a lot of those cobras and things like that are mostly neurotoxic. So again, uh, the diaphragmatic paralysis, you need to put them on a ventilator for a good long time. Um, so that can be kind of an issue there. But um, so again, always call the poison centers if you're not sure. Um, try to figure out you know, what, what, where you can actually source this stuff from. Um, has anyone heard of Venom 1? There's actually a TV show about it on TLC for like a short period of time. But um, basically down in Miami, uh, one of the, the EMS crews down there, um, their medical director, who's actually the medical director for the Miami Poison Center, um, they basically have a stock of antivenoms uh, for everything you can possibly imagine. For every type of snake, every type of um, uh, other venomous uh, creature out there, they carry it. And they, so they've actually... Um, you had a TV show about it where they, you know, people get bit by a black mamba or something and they actually transport uh, these antivenoms over to, to reverse some of these effects. So uh, very kind of interesting, but, you know, this, it could be another potential source we had. We actually had one bite, um, I believe it was a Mexican cantile from a, a, a handler that was very, very familiar to us. Um, <laughs> But basically, the ER residents, they didn't know what to do. They didn't call the poison center initially, so they ended up calling this Venom 1 and ended up spending probably 
$10,000 in transport charges to get this stuff flown up to uh, from Miami up to Jacksonville uh, in a timely manner. And we got there and we were just like, well, we can use CROFAB for this. It's, there's enough homology here. And so we ended up using CROFAB and the residents felt very dumb and they got into a lot of trouble. So um, always you know, check with your resources beforehand uh, just to make sure you don't uh, get yourself in trouble like that. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm probably just going to keep going through. If you guys are okay if I skip the break? Okay, hopefully, I see some shaking heads. I'm gonna go yes. All right. So if you use the, use the bathroom, go for it. Um, so caterpillars. Who thinks caterpillars are a problem? They're pretty cute. They're pretty cute. Yep. So that can lead to possible children being exposed to them, right? They hurt. They hurt. They actually absolutely hurt. I always bring up mainly because um, they are a very common occurrence, um, and they are very. Uh, they look cute. You may want to. You know, this one has a little saddle on it. Like, who wouldn't want to grab that guy? Um, but they actually are, are very, very painful and can lead to some problems. So um, some four indigenous ones you have here in Florida include like the saddleback, the pus caterpillar. I've seen a few of these actually being brought in. We have the IO moth and the hag. I don't know if someone's pretty mad at their wife or someone they named that one, I'm not sure, but whatever. Uh, the hag, the hag uh, caterpillar. They have these nice little spines uh, on them. Right? They're they're nice and fuzzy, and those, those spines it can be uh, very easy to, to pierce through skin. Um, they also have uh, toxins on on the spicules there that can also cause a lot of pain, a lot of um, irritation. So the problem is is that these uh, stings will come in and the pain is really out of proportion to what it actually looks like, right? So the patient will come in and they look totally fine. They are like crying in, in agonizing pain. It's really bad. Um, you know, we had one teenager came in, 16 year old boy who got stung by one of these uh, pus caterpillars. He's playing with it. Um, and comes in and they're just like, you need to man up. Like you need, you, we're not going to give you any meds for this. And I'm like, oh no, these caterpillars are super painful. It took like two doses of morphine to get this guy's pain under control. So do not underestimate them. They are very, very painful. Um, the big thing though is also that you want to go ahead and make sure you get the spines out so don't continue to cause any damage. And so do you guys know how we do that? Use any kind of tape we have. Um, so again, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, basically uh, lepidopterism is the clinical name for if you have a, a caterpillar sting here, uh, but you're going to see a lot of pain. You can see some uh, mild erythema, some swelling, and even uh, some tingling, some numbness uh, potentially, uh, depending on uh, where they got stung at. Um, vomiting can be associated with this just due to the intense kind of pain that they're experiencing, so that can be another thing you may need to treat. Um, and there's been some cases where you have eyes or the throat gets exposed, that can also lead to some swelling, uh, can be problematic there. Hopefully no throat exposures, but uh, occasionally. And then there's always a risk for having allergic reactions uh, to these caterpillars as well, so you want to be careful with that. So again, Scott Shape Fix All fixes you know, just about anything in your house or, or on your body. Um, so we go ahead and use this to help with decontamination. So we'll use tape, um, use the sticky side to help pull the hairs out, and that way it can prevent any kind of further pain or any toxins from being injected from that standpoint. Okay, And then just wash the soap and water. Again, no good use for prophylactic antibiotics, just good wound care is the, the best thing here. Um, antihistamines can be used for any kind of like swelling or any kind of allergic reactions you're having there. And again, uh, apply ice can help to deal with the pain. NSAIDs are useful. And then sometimes opioids are needed to, to really get that pain under control. Okay. Um, again, just manage allergic reactions, just like you guys know how to do so. Uh, and then finally, we have spiders. Again, trigger warning if you are afraid of spiders. There's some pictures here. Um, do you guys know uh, what the two most common types of spider envenomations are in, in Florida? Black widows, brown recluse. Those are the two big ones, right? And so everyone that comes in with a big old abscess on their butt, what did they say they were bitten by? A spider. A spider. The brown recluse got me, right? No, it was the MRSA spider, most likely, yes. So the MRSA spider is invisible to the human eye, um, but it will go around, bite all these patients, and all present to ER saying, hey, he bit me, he got me. And say, okay, well, we'll see about that. So anyway, so yeah, so these guys get very frequently uh, uh, blamed for abscesses and other skin infections that they probably had nothing to do with, but we will show uh, what the actual clinical effects of these bites are uh, so that we can at least recognize that and be like, no, that's actually a brown recluse. That looks really bad. So the first one uh, is going to be the Lactrodectus mactans, or the, the Black Widow. So obviously you can identify uh, her by the hourglass mark on there. Or if it looks like Scarlett Johansson, you know, watch out. Um, and we also have the, the Brown Recluse. Um, so does anyone know the other name for the, the um, uh, Brown Recluse? Based on the, the marking on his back here. Yeah, the fiddleback spider. Yeah, so hopefully you're not close enough to actually look for the fiddle, but it uh, looks kind of like a violin on his back there, so you can kind of tell uh, some of the differences uh, between those, uh, those spiders. There are other types of widows you may run into. There's red widows, brown widows. So again, they don't have to be black, um, but certainly uh, they are uh, common enough in Florida. Uh, you're going to see them with, with some regularity. Growing in their, um, their garages or... 
Hopefully not, yeah, but do you have some? Well, the thing is, we went to, like, we, we had a, like, boat somewhere mm -hmm. where I could storage plate, and we wrapped our trailer hitch, something just to protect it. Yep. And when I went to go take it off, like, three of them fell, and they had, like, a nest with our baby. I <laughs> yep. Yeah, very nightmare inducing. Um, yeah, so they like to they make these very chaotic webs, so like trash cans, uh, wood piles, different things like that. They're very, very common. Uh, they will make nests around. Um, it's important to note that most spiders are not venomous to humans, right? Most of them do not have fangs big enough or strong enough to actually break their human skin. So all, although almost all of them are venomous, um, they are unable to uh, envenomate humans. Okay, so that's a good thing. Um, but it's really difficult to ascertain if a true bite has occurred, mainly because of unreliable history. Unless you saw the spider, it's very difficult to say, yes, this is absolutely a spider bite. I may or may not see the two little fang marks, you know, if, uh, unless you're looking really close for it. Uh, and very possible this is more of a, uh, an infectious etiology, so the Merkel spider, as I mentioned. Um, there's a lot of propagation of misinformation. You know, everyone says, hey, I had a big abscess on my butt. It was a, it was a brown recluse that did this. And so like, it kind of gets propagated on and on and forth. But we'll look at what those wounds actually look like to see that that's definitely not what they look like. So uh, a couple of different varieties, as I mentioned, uh, the, the southern black widow is the most common one you're going to run into. It's a kind of classical kind of red hourglass kind of uh, shape on there, but it's certainly like the red widow, which I have pictured here, uh, you may also see. Uh, and again, uh, do you know if it's the, the male or the female that bites? The female, the, the larger ones, the small, uh, the males are, are small enough they can't actually break their human skin. Um, again, uh, restrooms, barns, sheds, garages, uh, so very common to have uh, potential exposures to these, especially if you're outside, you know, during summertime, things like that. Um, usually they're pretty shy, uh, but so, in, you know, unless you kind of reach your hands in somewhere or you're kind of uh, messing with it, uh, don't see a ton of bites from these. But uh, on a milligram per milligram basis, they have very, very potent venom, actually more so than even pit vipers. But because they're so small, they can't inject very much. Um, and the, the main toxin you're going to see here is this alpha latrotoxin. And so basically uh, it causes a very, very painful bite. Um, Second, one of the first things you're going to know, again, pain out of proportion to what it actually looks like. So very similar to the caterpillars here. Um, very painful. You may see a pair of red, red dots uh, develop there from, from the actual bite. Um, and generally, for most people, you're going to find mostly local effects, um, but you're going to find that the alpha latrotoxin works by opening up these, these cation channels, causes a lot of uh, muscle contractions, so cramping is, is a very, very common thing you're going to see with this. Lots of calcium being flowing in, um, releasing acetylcholine, norepinephrine, all these things are happening. Um, and so the patients get very, very uncomfortable with these type of bites, and pain is going to be one of the main uh, presentations here. So um, we call this lactrodectism. Uh, it's a clinical name for this. Uh, you're going to find the bite usually is going to uh, onset of pain is usually within 30 minutes to, to two hours or so. And you start to see these painful cramping and these fasciculations to start up based on how it's affecting uh, those uh, ion channels, causing the muscle to contract um, involuntarily. Um, typically, you'll see the cramping start to kind of progress intrapidally, depending on how bad the bite was. Um, and in some cases, you even see kind of board-like rigidity that can develop. Um, the patients who are most at risk from a black widow bite for serious complications are the very young and they're very, very old, right? Um, so very young infants, uh, I've seen bites happen where they can get uh, other systemic effects like hypertension. So this can be very bad. So, you know, hypertensive crisis is not unheard of uh, with an infant bite. Um, Tachycardia, you can get uh, regional diaphoresis, so you can, you know, if the left arm was bit, you just have sweating on the one arm, which is kind of interesting. Um, nausea, vomiting, and potentially respiratory arrest. So fortunately, very uncommon you would see that, but again, uh, very young and very old are more likely to see these central effects. So treatment, obviously ABC is the first thing, wound care, tetanus prophylaxis, and again, analgesia is needed. Um, using uh, muscle relaxants, so they're having a lot of fasciculations and cramping, so things like, um, you know, uh, benzodiazepines like diazepam can be very good for this. Uh, opioids in order to get the, the pain under control from that standpoint. Um, some people used to recommend calcium, but it's kind of, uh, it doesn't really work that well uh, to help fix the, the underlying issues, so we don't really recommend that very frequently. And there is an anti-venom available but we do not use it very frequently. So again, this is not something you would commonly find stocked in most hospitals. Uh, we don't use it very often. So uh, again, this is a full equine antibody. So very high risk for anaphylaxis. So that's one reason why we don't like to use it. Um, and usually if you can just manage them symptomatically, give them some pain meds, they're generally fine. They don't necessarily need to have antivenom given for that. But uh, if they are pregnant, very old, very young, those are the cases where we may consider. So the one case I've seen, the uh, Black Widow antivenom being used was in the case of a very young infant uh, was bitten, developed hypertensive crisis, which again, you know, infants don't really tolerate uh, hypertension very well. Uh, we ended up giving, uh, giving the anti-venom, we were able to reverse that very quickly, and the kid did fine. They unfortunately, or fortunately did not have any anaphylaxis to that. So again, rare they would need to use it, uh, but could use it occasionally. 
a typical 24, 48 hours, uh, they're going to be fine. If you can't get their pain under control, they may need to be admitted for observation, but most of the time you can kind of manage them in the ER and send them on their way. This is a non-venomous spider, <laughs> FYI. A little dated reference, but... Um, the other big one is the Loxoceles reclusa, or the uh, the brown recluse here. Uh, why do we call them the brown recluse? They like to be alone, they're reclusive. I'm like a white recluse, generally. <laughs> um, again, you'll find that... <laughs> um, these are not indigenous to Florida. <laughs> crying on the inside. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so anyway, uh, brown recluses, <laughs> these are not uh, native to Florida, so you don't typically find them having their own nest here. Uh, sometimes you will have hitchhikers that will travel in uh, from like, out of state, uh, so you do find these kind of in the southwest, but typically not Florida. So if you, know, if you go camping out in Georgia, things like that, sometimes you have hitchhikers that kind of make their way back, so you may kind of find these isolated nests. Um, so again, they're very reclusive by nature. So they, you know, like to live in dark places. Uh, they uh, usually find that bites are defensive. So if you kind of reach in and, and get bitten there, um, and again, they're blamed for way more bites than they actually uh, should be. Because uh, again, when you see the actual bites and what they look like, you know that okay, yeah, this is absolutely a, uh, a brown recluse. You can again notice that kind of fiddle back appearance there on their head. So we call this a necrotic arachnidism. Uh, and essentially what you find is that uh, the, the venom itself has lots of different components to it, but the main ones being hyaluronidase. You guys heard of that one before? Where do we use that normally? Hmm? Okay, so maybe use it for wrinkles. I was thinking more like using it for um, breaking down like subcutaneous like tissue, a connective tissue. Um, sometimes we'll use that if you have like drug extravasations or if you're trying to do hypodermoplysis, which is a subcutaneous fluid administration. We'll actually use hyaluronidase to break down some of that subcutaneous uh, connective tissue. But um, the same thing will happen here. Uh, and also has this uh, product called sphingomyelinase D, which actually uh, works to kind of break down some of the, uh, the lipid bilayers and the cells that it affects. Also, you're going to end up having uh, potential attraction of, of your immune systems. White blood cells are also going to be infiltrating here, uh, and, and you can potentially see systemic hemolysis. And so when you, patients have big problems with this, it's usually that hemolysis, typically seen in very young patients, uh, potentially. So there's some good case reports out there where you can see that occurring. Um, what you normally see with these bites is they, perform, uh, they cause this bullseye lesion that happens over about 1 to 12 hours or so. We call that uh, basically kind of red, white, and blue lesion, where they have usually kind of like a blue kind of necrotic core, um, kind of blanched skin outside of that, kind of the white, and then kind of red air theme outside of that. And so uh, they're very slow healing. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do for these. Some people may say, well, let's excise it. If you do that, you're going to just find that it spreads out from wherever you, the excision was, right? Um, so not a whole lot you can do besides just providing good supportive wound care uh, for those patients. Um, other systemic effects you can see, fevers and chills, uh, some myalgias, and that intravascular hemolysis is the, the major thing you're worried about. Sometimes patients have required exchange for infusions in order to overcome that, unfortunately, uh, and then rarely can see this, uh, this DIC uh, that can pop up there. So again, good wound care, tetanus prophylaxis. There is some um, uh, notes that you could potentially use uh, the drug Dapsone, uh, which is not one we talked about uh, very frequently. It's in, uh, used in some infectious disease cases, but um, that is thought to uh, reduce in the severity of the necrotic ulcers. Um, but again, we don't have a lot of good data. Not a lot of these bites are so infrequent; they don't have a lot of good studies to show us what the optimal treatment is going to be. Um, there is some theory that you can use hyperbaric oxygen in order to help, because uh, again, hyperbaric oxygen works very good for other types of wounds. The thought is this can help to heal the wound uh, healing process for these patients. As as well, so you may see that used uh, occasionally. And that's pretty much for the talk section. Do you guys have any questions? Can I tell you the black mamba story real quick? Yeah. Okay, so we had a, uh, a collector who was well known to our to our service uh, at the Jacksonville Center, uh, and so basically he had come in for uh, other types of, of venomous bites. He was a Mexican cantile. We had um, had like a monocelic cobra. If you ever see like the cobra, just like kind of the one circle on the back of their head, like the monocelic cobra. Um, but basically, uh, we had gotten a call that overnight he'd come in with a black mamba bite. And so I was like, well, how in the heck is he getting a black mamba bite? So do you guys know how um, exotic snakes, um, how they're kind of regulated here in Florida? Okay, hopefully not, right? Hopefully none of you guys carry your own snakes. Um, so basically what it is is that if you want to have an exotic reptile license, um, you can uh, you have to start out typically what they'll do is they'll usually get like an eastern diamond back or they'll get a water moccasin or something. And the rules are is if you have an exotic snake or a venomous reptile, you have to have the anti-venom for it, okay? So they'll say, well, every hospital is crow fab. So if I get bit, I go to the hospital, I can get treated, I'm fine. So they say, okay, sounds good. Here's your license. 
and then they can get whatever they want, right? Uh, there's really not a whole lot of restrictions. That's why you have issues like pythons being released down in South Florida. This is why you have issues of uh, these cobras. And you, uh, you guys know the most recent one that happened in Ocala? Cobra got loose there, right? So again, it's legal for them to have these snakes if they have the license. Don't go to Ocala. There's a cobra on the loose. <laughs> Anywho, my wife was like, I'm so glad I moved out of Ocala because otherwise we'd be getting a new house right now. So fortunately, we're down here. So anyway, so... Um, uh, so they get the license, they can have whatever snakes they want. Very frequently, they do not care their anti venoms, which is a problem uh, problem for a lot of them. So anyway, so this guy who we knew uh, very well, he um, basically was on a, a snake board, I guess, a uh, message board. They're communicating about snakes, talking about how awesome they are, I guess. Um, and this one guy's like, uh, up in, I believe he's like in South Carolina or somewhere, and he said, hey, I got this black mamba. It's illegal for me to have this. And the guy down here in Florida says, like, oh, well, I can trade you for some that you can carry because some other states have better restrictions on that sort of thing. And they say, okay, let's do an exchange. They say, okay, let's go to somewhere where it's illegal for both of us to do it so that way you're, I know you're not a cop. I guess there's, like, snake cops out there. So anyway. <laughs> right. So, so in the dead of night in the Wendy's parking lot, they, uh, they meet in Georgia where it's mutually uh, uh, illegal for them to, to be there with these snakes. And the guy says, okay, well, you know, here's here's my snakes. I'm going to give you some, some water moccasins or whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, packaged nicely in the cage or whatever, whatever he did. Uh, and the guy's like, oh, well, the black mamba's in, in the trunk. So he goes and opens up the trunk and he finds a pillowcase there. Yeah, it's a pillowcase. So uh, he picks it up and he wants to look at it to make sure that actually it's a black mom, but it's not something else. Right? You know, make sure we can get gypped. Um, so he opens this up, uh, and sure enough, the snake jumps out because it's mad it's in a pillowcase and it starts slithering away. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the black mamas are the fastest land snakes in the world. So the guy who's trying to chase after the snake uh, ends up trying to grab it, ends up getting bit. And then the snake runs off. I have no idea if they ever found the snake or not, but oh, potentially oh, no. several years ago. So maybe it got bit, you know, a bird got it or something. So anyway, so this guy said, so this guy was smart enough to be uh, be a danger to himself for sure, but he at least was smart enough to go, okay, this is the problem. Okay. Um, so the black mamba falls into that lapidae kind of family of snakes, uh, and it's very likely cause uh, uh, that neuro same kind of neurotoxic effects you see with uh, the coral snake. So it's going to cause uh, paralysis. You're going to see diplopia. You're going to see paresthesias. You're going to see numbness. Eventually, diaphragmatic paralysis. Right. He knew that was going to happen eventually. So he said, "Well, I need to get back to Florida, where if I, you know, said I was bitten by a black mamba, I'm not going to get in trouble for it." So he's trying to drive back to Florida, um, and all of a sudden he starts to notice he's getting his double vision. Right. Telltale sign that yeah this, this neurotoxin is, is starting to affect him. So he says, okay, let me go to um, let me go to uh, uh, the first ER I find and try to tell them, hey, don't give me crofab. It's not going to work for this. Because again, a lot of people if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't know what to treat it with. Goes to an ER. Um, he tries to write BM on his arm. So a lot of people couldn't figure out what BM was for a while until we got the history that it was actually a black mamba. Um, he goes in there and says, you know, trying to say he's bitten by a snake, but now he's starting to get dysarthritis, right? Now he can't actually kind of voice the fact of what actually happened to him. So um, while he's there, uh, he's trying to tell them, no, don't give me crofab. So fortunately, they never gave him any uh, and eventually intubated him there and then flew him over to our hospital, right, for kind of further management. So there, um, Somehow we were able to get the full history. I think his wife was able to tell us what was going on. Uh, and so we were able to, they, you know, the lady's a saint for saying married to him. But um, <laughs> eventually we was able to get the history. And then we said, okay, well, we know this is a black mom, but we know it can be treated by, uh, we use that same website with the AZA uh, to figure out what you can actually treat a black mamba uh, bite with. And so we found the venom, went to the zoo, got the South African uh, anti-venom uh, that was made for a lot of different snakes in the area. Again, because you try to uh, maximize uh, those anti-venoms for making them you know, kind of cross-reactive for a lot of snakes. Uh, brought it back, uh, ended up giving it to him. It was the second time getting that same anti-venom. So of course the anaphylaxis, right? Um, so we pre-treated him beforehand knowing that was a risk. Uh, we ended up um, giving him uh, an epi drip in order to keep his blood pressure stable. Uh, and again, once they're kind of intubated, once they've already had that, uh, you know, shown that they're having that respiratory failure, um, the antivenom doesn't reverse those effects, right? Uh, it'll prevent it from getting any worse. So he ended up being on the vent for probably three days or so, and eventually he was able to um, kind of breathe on his own and get off of that. Uh, ended up doing very well uh, afterwards, uh, and I don't think he ever was bitten by another black mamba, but uh, that was one of my last cases I got to deal with with him, so that was, uh, it was a very interesting one. So again, don't play with exotic snakes. That's the ultimate answer there. Okay. Any questions I can answer for you guys? All right. If not, I will uh, see you guys next Tuesday. <laughs>